Hey everybody, welcome back to Big Rift Energy. This is episode 21, The Making of Enlightened in Eternity. This episode has been sort of like ripping off a band-aid more than any of the other ones. I've, I've been putting this off and I had a strange time forcing myself to sit down here and talk about this because it brings up some pretty painful stuff, which I'll get to. Uh, but I'll start with the writing process here. You know, I'm sure that this album will, musically was written and demoed by the time Divided by Darkness came out, which was May 2019. So I'm pretty sure I wrote this stuff at the end of 2018 and obviously beginning of 2019. I distinctly remember I was living in a new place. You know, I wrote, I wrote uh, the first couple Spirit of Drift releases in a place in Tempe, Arizona. And then I wrote uh, Curse and Divided in a place in Mesa, right over by the <laughs> Zia Records Mesa, right over there. And then Enlightened, we were definitely living in uh, Chandler, Arizona at the time. And I remember Divided was such a grueling process, just as I explained on that episode, pushing myself to the extreme physically, mentally, doing a lot of weird stuff, just going really, really, really hard. And I didn't want to do another album as a fast turnaround. I mean, I don't mean ever, but I, w I remember being in a position of like, okay, that one really kicked my ass. Uh, there's no, there's no rush doing another one. Like, let me just chill for a while. And this is at the height of the, the chaos between the two touring bands, both bands touring full time, both bands recording all the time. And I was just like, man, I don't, I don't need to do that to myself right away. Let me just chill. Obviously that didn't happen. And I remember the genesis of that. The first two songs I wrote the music for on Enlightened were, uh, I can't remember what order, but I think Astral Levitation was first and Ride Into the Light was second. I know those were the first two. And I, the farthest thing from my mind was working on a new Spirit of Drift album. But every time I picked up a guitar, something cool would come out that was getting me excited. And eventually it was kind of like, oh, all right, God damn it. And I realized I was working on a new album. What sort of dictated allowing myself to start that process again was this idea that I was just going to have fun with it. I wasn't going to try to break myself in half like I did with the last album, pushing my playing abilities, pushing, pushing every limitation that I had. <laughs> you know, I told myself from the get go, this one's going to be fun. That's it. That's the only rule. That's the only goal. I need to make an album for me that I enjoy writing, recording songs. I en I'm going to enjoy playing and that established the direction for enlightened and eternity. I do remember demoing something in that house that we lived in in Chandler uh cosmic conquest like the double harmony guitar solo thing i think it's after the second chorus i was kind of struggling on where that song should go then uh and i i think i was going to do like a either just like a standard guitar solo or something left field I, I had ideas kicking around and then I just thought about trouble and how cool it is to play a guitar solo and then have guitar two harmonize the entire guitar solo. And in order to do that, you have to write something relatively not simple, but straightforward. And I, I distinctly remember my favorite moment of the writing process for enlightened and eternity. I had tracked the root. So basically solo a, Right, I had tracked that for Cosmic Conquest, 
And then I was like, oh God, I got to harmonize this. And normally what I would do is sit down with a guitar, pinpoint all the notes on solo A, and then write all the harmonies out and then learn it and then record it, right? And there's your demo. But I didn't do that for some reason. I just hit record on my laptop and here comes a solo and I ripped the harmonies and every note was right on, the, on solo B as I was playing it live, you know, nailed the harmonies. First try, couldn't believe it. I mean, I've never done anything like that before or since on the first try. And I remember just like jumping off the couch, being super excited. Most of my favorite moments with Spirit Adrift have been those type of moments of spontaneous, creative magic, you know, that you could never plan, that you could never work toward, that you could never practice or anything. They just happen. Uh, I remember being super excited by that. So for sure, the demos were done by May 2019 because Dave at 20 bucks spin and I have the running joke. Hey, the new album's out. Do you have the next one written yet? And I distinctly remember <laughs> saying, yeah, here it is. Uh, one thing I do have written down, my initial idea for this album was to do an A side of short, fast songs and a B side of maybe two or three longer doom songs. A lot more like the earlier Spirit of Drift stuff. Uh, but I found that to be a little bit limiting and arbitrary. And it just, the songs I was writing were, were so cool that I kind of threw that idea away. You can kind of see it with the last song. Obviously that's a really long, slow song. Um, but I had kind of gotten sick of like putting these weird inside jokes slash artistic goals on myself. Like I had with the two previous records. So I just kind of let it rip. Um, and we ended up with the album that we ended up with. So, uh, at some point, I guess June, let's see here, May, May 18th, we embarked on our tour for Divided by Darkness. Our first show was in Phoenix at the Rebel Lounge. We had Haunt supporting us on the West Coast, and then on the East Coast, we met up with High Command. Pretty cool. It was a good tour. Uh, the kickoff show was great. I'm pretty sure I told this story on the Divided by Darkness episode of Finding the Giant Sack of Meth Amphetamine in San Diego, day two. Uh, yeah, that was a cool tour. And let's see. I think I mentioned this on that episode as well. The drive uh, on June 3rd, 2019, between Denver and Chicago, Illinois. I wrote lyrics in the van. I had a psychedelic experience riding in the van for however many, 12 hours or something. It was raining. It was gray. I remember walking in when we stopped and I walked into a Jimmy John's and they had the first Wolf Mother album turn up to 10 in there. I mean, like so loud that you couldn't hear each other talk. It was awesome. So I had, yeah, a psychedelic experience that day. I wrote lyrics to Right Into the Light. Cosmic Conquest, Screaming from Beyond, Astral Levitation, and I think that's it. But then when we got to Sanford's house, I wrote all the lyrics to Reunited in the Void right there in Sanford's basement where he was living in Chicago at the time. Uh, so, si yeah, six, five out of the eight songs I wrote the lyrics to that one day. Um, and I know I wrote some of the lyrics to like Battle High and maybe Stronger Than Your Pain uh, driving back to Arizona at the end of that tour. Lyrically this time, you know, I was thinking about Vulgar Display of Power and Dio Records and a lot of the Rob Halford stuff. Uh, I was reading, I have some books here behind me. So I was really into um, the Tao Te Ching, which... Marcus turned me on to, you know, old school Eastern philosophy. Also, coming a little bit later in a different region of the world, the meditations of Marcus Aurelius, right? Coming a little bit later in a different region of the world, Alan Watts, I was reading a lot of his stuff. And then this book, it's like the ultimate um, 
striving LA screenwriter, like self-help <laughs> book, but it's really good. Uh, the power of now Eckhart Tolle. Uh, so yeah, getting philosophical. I had delved so much into anger and chaos and evil and you know, chaos, magic, and weird, creepy, spooky shit on the last record that I kind of wanted to go the other way. And that informed the album title. Obviously, I, I was thinking a long time of what to call the E album. And I had all these goofy ass ideas like evil is eternal and all that. I'm like, man, who hasn't put an album out called the evil is eternal? So I was just kind of kind of examining what I had gone through with the process of making Divided by Darkness, and I thought it would be cool to do basically the complete opposite, uh, thematically at least. So that's what I remember about the writing process. Uh, things were pretty good in my life, and I wanted to write uh, yeah, an album that reminded me of like hearing Vulgar Display of Power when I was... 13 or 14 and hearing those lyrics about like not letting the man get you down and believing in yourself. And, you know, it didn't come from a place of like goofball, uh, motivational speaker type crap. We had those kind of people show up when I was in the middle and high school. I hated their guts, hated them. We heckled the shit out of them. I remember some guy showed up in high school the whole time he was talking, he was like painting this mural and when he got done with this like motivational bullshit, the mural was like his yellow Hummer that he owned. And I'm pretty sure he like painted himself, like posed in front of his own yellow Hummer. So I was trying to avoid that um, and go with the more, yeah, Phil Anselmo 92, Rob Halford Dio type stuff. And then these great minds behind me, you know, they all seem to arrive at a lot of the same conclusions. So I wanted to write an album about that, about uh, not diving into the darkness, but figuring out how to get through it, you know, and persevere and not be miserable in a really difficult world. So that's, that's what I remember about the writing process there. Uh, we finished the United States tour for Divided by Darkness um, I can't remember what all else was going on that year. I'm pretty sure Gate Creeper recorded something at some point. Pretty sure Spirit Adrift recorded our cover of Supernaut for the Volume 4 tribute. We were going to do Snowblind. That was choice number one. They gave it to Bongzilla. And then Bongzilla ended up not being able to do it. And they gave it to some band called Green Lung. And I remember thinking, like, man, I hope they have clean vocals. I love Bongzilla. But Snowblind is, is the vocals are so good. The vocal melodies. I was like, man, please let Green Lung have clean vocals. And I heard it and I was really psyched and since become a fan of that band. And we're talking about hopefully touring together. So that's an aside. But I'm pretty sure we recorded Supernaut at some point in 2019. Uh yeah, I had to have. And then yeah, September, uh Spirit of Drift took off for Europe. Uh-huh, with Sanhedrin, and did like a week and a half, two weeks over there. That was Spirit of Drift's first time in Europe. Super rad. Uh, yeah, I got some good memories from that. We blew a tire on the Autobahn, and uh, Eric from Gay Creeper was playing guitar for us on that tour, so we are sharing three members at that point. And I remember we were all sitting in the van with all these cars whizzing by us, and Eric was like, man, fuck this, and put on the orange vest and we just went out in the woods in Germany off the Autobahn, dicked around out there. And then the van company put us up in a, in a motel on some like weird, obscure wicker man, like farm town. It's a cool day. It's weird. The stuff you remember, I remember the good shows, but that's my, my number one memory is just like screwing around in the woods in Germany. Okay. So while we were over there, we confirmed a tour for spring of 2020 with Corrosion of Conformity. Our boy Bruno, who was driving, doing merch, booked the tour and was tour managing, literally booked, <laughs> like confirmed that tour 
with one hand on his cell phone while he's driving the van with his other hand. <laughs> Guy's a beast, man. Shout out Bruno if you're listening to this, man. Love you, buddy. Uh, so yeah, we, a few of the guys, cause you know, like I said, spirit of drift and gate creeper sharing three members at this point. And let me take a moment real quick. Part of the reason that I started this podcast, maybe not in the top five reasons that I started it, but definitely something on my mind is like when I'm doing press cycles for albums and stuff like that, which I'm in the middle of one right now. When you do a press cycle, you have to repeat yourself. However many people you talk to, that's how many times you have to repeat yourself. And it gets really fucking old. And part of the reason I did this podcast is so when I'm in an interview and somebody asks me about something that's already been covered, I can literally just be, <laughs> be a dick, be an asshole, and just be like, oh, I have a podcast episode about that. Just go. I... I would advise anyone interested in that topic to go listen to that. And so that I don't have to keep talking about the same shit. Um, and in 2020, I did an interview with metal injection thinking it was going to be about a reissue of the first spirit of drift album. But he asked me about this situation that I'm about to talk about. And he turned that into the fucking headline, which is a common occurrence and kind of fucking annoying. Uh, but here's the deal. We were sharing three members. Both bands had already turned down a ton of fucking tours. Uh, the guys that were in both bands were getting to like go tour as much as we wanted to while the other dudes were just stuck at home and not really feeling great about that. And I don't blame them. So there had been some rumblings of like, we need to split these bands up, you know, and I had kind of, you know, when I formed the live band for spirit of drift, it, a lot of people don't know I was doing this before I was in Gate Creeper and joined Gate Creeper after recording the first couple of Spirit of Drift releases. And I kind of had that thought in the beginning when it became a live band of like, you know, me and Chase were best buds at the time and I wanted him in the band, but I'm a like a uh, catastrophizer. I future project a lot. And I was like, well, what happens if there's like clashes and stuff like that? And we actually did think about that from the beginning. But then we just said, fuck it, like, this is who I want to be in a band with, right? But then by September 2019, we're sharing three members. Both bands are pretty popular. We're both recording all the time. We're both touring all the time. We're both turning down tours that would make you cry to have to turn down. And a lot of those have been remedied by now. But back then it was like we were making some very painful decisions and saying no when it really hurt a lot you know so we booked this uh this coc tour while we were over there in europe september 2019 and we had a sit down we split the bands up while we were on that tour and it was heavy like it you know we didn't take it lightly at all none of us did uh, but we really didn't see a choice so i literally had some dude ask me yesterday on one of these videos are you still in gate creeper? I'm like, brother, it's, it's like four years old almost like, please. I, I don't expect everybody to know every detail about these bands and our lives and shit, but dude, four years late, brother. So that's out of the way. And so now anytime anybody ever asks me about this again, I can just say, go, go listen to big riff energy episode 21. And I can avoid one more annoying question. So there's that. That happened while we were in Europe. And we came back from Europe. Uh, I did another Gate Creeper tour. I was basically putting in my my notice. You know, Jeff from Spirit of Drift and Goya, ex-Spirit of Drift, he did the same thing when he left the band. He gave us, you know, one last tour, gave us notice and everything. And I thought that was super cool. Uh, not leaving us hanging, you know. So that kind of was in my mind, like... Let me tell them before this tour so that there's like way more than enough time to find somebody and did that last gate creeper tour came back and I was feeling great. I came back home December 2019 and uh, was just like feeling solid, feeling a big sense of um, freedom or something. 
Uh, and that's nothing against gate creep or anything like that. It's just like the amount of time that was out of my, like the amount of my life where I didn't have really much of a say in what I'm doing. <laughs> it was like, and it was getting out to where it's like six months in advance, a year in advance. I already know what my life looks like. And there's no, like, it was just a huge commitment being in both of those bands and touring and recording and doing all that in two bands uh, that are like not, neither one of them was a side project, you know? So I, yeah, getting home in December, 2019, I was feeling really good and had this new spirit of drift album demoed, had the lyrics. I knew that some of it would probably continue to change. You know, when I demo something, it's not done. It's not done until it's, I mean, it's not ever done really. But I mean, I, I tweak stuff all the way up until we're in the studio. And then we keep tweaking stuff in the studio, tweaking lyrics. I was just looking at my lyrics and I, I was crossing them out and changing them while I was tracking them, you know? Uh, so I, but I have this album ready to go, right? Pretty sure the artwork was ready to go. I'll talk a little bit about the artwork later. And I am like, all right, kick ass. I'm, I'm totally free. I'm going to focus on this a hundred percent. We're going to make the best album we've ever made. And I was feeling great. It was nothing wrong going on. Pretty sure I had like quit smoking cigarettes and shit. Uh, and then I'm not going to talk about this cause I don't like to, but, um, yeah, then our dog started dying, you know, and it's very unexpected. Uh, Marcus, our drummer's dog had died right before the European tour, right before. And he went on the tour and I just remember studying, not studying, but just you can't help but pick up on, damn, like this guy is tough. Like, you know, he wasn't like um, being macho, pushing it down or anything like that. He's just handling it really well, you know. And we went on that tour and he, it, there was never like a consideration in his mind of like, my dog died, I can't do the tour, right? And I think, honestly, I would have understood had he said that, but he didn't. He was like, I, we got to go do this. You know, I got, I got to go on this tour. Uh, and then, yeah, December 2019, I find myself in the same boat. And yeah, like I said, I, I really don't want to talk about that process and I'm not going to, but, but it's funny what you remember is I remember the music that I was listening to while we were going through that. Uh, there was this, I don't even remember how I found out about it, but there's a Loretta Lynn album produced by Jack White of all people who I don't really care that much about. And I think he played on it too. It's called Van Leer Rose. And I was listening to that every day and I can't listen to that album anymore. I won't be able to listen to it ever again. Uh, I remember going to the gym and like blew out both knees on the elliptical listening to Somewhere in Time by Iron Maiden. Fortunately, I can still listen to that one. That was like my rage album. <laughs> Carnivore Retaliation and the, when I was lifting weights, right? Trying to get the demons out through massive weights. And uh, Iron Maiden Somewhere in Time was what I was listening to when I was doing the cardio, you know? And I I just remember, like, I, I remember so distinctly trying to burn my feelings out of my body and not being able to do it. Uh, but that, yeah, it's, it's just funny. I, the music, it's always like, it's always the music that I remember tied to any like significant moments in my life. Right. Um, so the dog ended up dying, I believe on January 2nd, 2020, we had been talking about moving somewhere you know, the past couple of years of touring, I've been looking at spots. I like Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. Um, a couple other spots. You know, I would look at some spots in like Idaho. I'd be like, oh, this looks like a cool little town and get on Zillow or whatever. And the houses are like a million and a half dollars. <laughs> I'm like, oh, shit, never mind, man. Like some town, you little town you've never even heard of. But we were looking at different spots, you know, I... I only plan on being in Phoenix for a year and ended up being there nine years because I met my wife. 
but I was over it. I was so, so over it. And I wanted to get back to, if not a small town, at least a small city, um, either Midwest or South, like a little bit friendlier environment, you know? And yeah, the dog died January 2nd. And we were in the process of seriously looking at moving to Austin. And she had interviews like five days after the dog died. And then we went and did that together and came back. And the reason I'm telling you all this is to give you a timeline of how fucking tough and crazy this was. Like three days after we got back from that, so maybe two week and a half, two weeks after the dog dies, we're in the studio in Tucson recording in light and eternity. And I don't want to fucking be there. I don't want to be there. Uh, but it, you know, I don't want to be anywhere. So might as well. Right. And suddenly I really 100% understand and empathize with what Marcus was dealing with on the European tour. Right. It's like, well, I don't want to be anywhere, so I might as well be here like doing something, doing anything, you know? And I think about um, all the synchronicity of Spirit Adrift and all the weird, unexplainable stuff that's happened that's like been more productive and more amazing than anything that I could have intentionally planned out. And when we were recording this album, I just remembered being so grateful to whatever force it was, whether it was internal or, or cosmic or whatever that made me decide to write uplifting, almost like feel good songs and fun, like a fun heavy metal record. Right. That's all I could think of. I was like, this is hard enough recording these really kick-ass fun songs with super, like you can do it you know, unlock your full potential type lyrics. I mean, that was hard enough. And I can't imagine what that experience would have been like if I had written another album like Divided by Darkness, which was all about really difficult topics and really upsetting topics. You know, I don't know. I don't know. I want to say I don't know if I could have finished it, but I probably could have. Uh, you just do it. You show up and you fucking do it, right? Uh, we recorded in light and eternity with Ryan Bram at home wrecker in Tucson. We had worked with him a couple times before we did the, uh, eyes were not alive single, uh, which he tracked and our boy, Arthur Rizik actually, uh, played a solo on and mixed and mastered. Uh, we did the, yeah, once again, the volume four super not cover with Ryan Bram. We had done a couple gate creeper things with him. And yeah, it was always a kick-ass time. So decided we were going to work with Ryan for Enlightened. And I remember, you know, crashing with him at night. We were just watching comedies because we just couldn't handle anything else. <laughs> we were just feeling so fucked up. Uh, we watched Tropic Thunder. I remember that distinctly. It was Marx's first time seeing it. I had a good time with that. Uh, and every day I was waking up probably at 8, 8 a.m. and leaving Bram's house to go to, the, uh, to go to the gym, actually. And I remember, you know, I was listening to Everything Dies by Typo Negative a lot. That's when I made the decision that I definitely wanted to cover that song at some point. But I remember, like, the drive to the studio, driving towards the mountains in Tucson every morning, looking at the mountains and knowing intellectually how beautiful and breathtaking that view was. You know, it's January. The weather is like incredible. And knowing that I should feel moved and just in awe of what I'm looking at and just feeling nothing, nothing, you know, and just going in the gym and, you know, listen to reinventing a steel or, or I hate God or carnivore or whatever. And just like forcing myself to feel something, even if it was physical pain or whatever. Uh, so that by the time I got to the studio, I could, I could play with emotion and I could sing with emotion and that sort of thing. Uh, and I know 
a few of these songs we had to do, uh, you know, I would think uh, Cosmic Conquest in particular, I thought I was done with the vocals and I listened to them the next day and I was like, this sucks. It was just flat, just totally flat. And so I went back the, the next day and changed the melody and went way higher with it so that it sounded more, uh, sounded like it had more feeling and more struggle and more uh, excitement to it. You know, I do remember tracking vocals for Harmony of the Spheres and all of us being like, holy shit, that sounds really good. Uh, I think that was the first moment since I started Spirit Adrift where I felt like I was achieving my full potential as a singer. Not to say that anything before that was bad. Uh, I'm just really critical of myself and I'm a realist, you know, and I, I know what I'm capable of and I just never did feel like I was nailing that. But I, I distinctly remember Harmony of the Spheres listening back to those vocals and even just the feeling, the physical feeling of performing those vocals felt so good. And Enlightened is definitely the first Spirit of Drift album where I'm stoked on the vocals. I love, I'm, I'm, I don't want to say I love all the other stuff. I don't listen to it, if we're being honest. I think anybody that sits around listening to their own music is a fucking sociopath or just weirdo or something. But I, I, don't, I don't have anything against our previous material. But I know for sure that my best vocal performance up to that point is Enlightened Eternity, by far. It's the first one that doesn't irk me like frequently when I happen to hear it. Um, and Harmony of the Spheres was a high point. Reunited in the Void, definitely a high point. Marcus and I brought in our dog's collars for that song to jingle around, you know, tambourines and shit for the outro of reunited in the void. Uh, I remember blowing Ryan Bram's mind with the pink Floyd echoes seagulls technique, which we've done on the new album as well. Ghost to the gallows. You can look it up on, on YouTube how to do that, but it's like, once again, just a complete happy accident that David Gilmore like randomly stumbled across to make those crazy psychedelic like seagull type noises. Uh, so reunited in the void, definitely like a, a highlight. We did a lot of different stuff on that one too. We used uh, Sun Model T's. I'm not quite sure what we used on the other songs. I think it was probably a Yamaha T100 modded, which is basically a Soldano. I shouldn't be giving that away. Fuck. Don't tell anybody about that those things are still affordable. <laughs> Sorry, Bram. Uh, so we definitely used that. We used a Marshall, I don't know. Oh, we used a Marshall JCM 800 bass for bass. That's what the amp's called, Marshall JCM 800 bass. Uh, and this was the first Spirit of Drift album where we didn't use a lot of gain on the bass, and it sounded heavier. I've heard a lot of like really old school rock and hard rock and I guess proto metal guys talk about that. If you don't distort the bass, I mean, I say we didn't distort it. We drove it like real hard on the amp, right? But we didn't, we didn't muck it up with like a bunch of overdrives and fuzz pedals and shit like that. But on Reunite in the Void, we didn't, we didn't use like the metal amp setup. We used Sun Model T's probably with like a rat pedal on it, I would imagine. And then we use a really old Gibson Titan, I think it's called, that Bram had. And that's kind of the uh, Neil Young sounding tone, somewhere between clean and distorted. One little joke that I did have for myself on this album was that there would be no clean guitar because I was so tired of tap dancing on stage, turning the distortion on and off playing these like intricate riffs and sort of tricky changes and singing. And uh, I was just like, you know what? No clean guitar on this album. That's getting really old. Uh, but there is that Neil Young kind of clangy Southern Rocky sounding guitar. That's a Gibson Titan. Uh, Marcus's brother Preston once again played some synth and keys and stuff, organ all across the album. I know the Moog like mono synth 
on the last riff before the outro of Ride Into the Light, you might not even know it's there. But I remember playing that. I, I did play, I was like die hard about playing that part because uh, it reminded me a little bit of Rush Spirit of Radio. One of those choruses in that song, uh, or it might be a verse, they introduce a really mixed down, subtle mono synth that's just following the chord progression. And I always thought that was cool. That's like some Quincy, Quincy Jones type shit or Mutt Lang, where if a part comes back, you always want to change it a little bit, either add something, pull something, change something, whatever. And I remember on the whiteboard writing, um, all this, mach all this machinery making modern music can still be open hearted. That's a lyric from spirit of radio because we were talking a lot about how we wanted a classic sound with modern fidelity. And that's always kind of been the goal of this project sonically, right? As far as our studio recordings and our live stuff too, I guess we want it to sound classic, meaning we don't want it to sound dated. Uh, we don't want it to sound dated to 1970 just as much as we don't want it to sound dated to 2022 because you're screwing yourself because at some point like things are what year is it 2023 i thought i was in 2022 but point being you don't want to date yourself to any period because then like if you're hoping that people are listening to your shit in 10 20 50 years it's gonna be yeah it's not gonna be that cool especially if you're trying to date it to anything post 1995 yeah good luck so that was always kind of the goal is we, we wanted to sound classic, but have modern fidelity, right? Iron Maiden wasn't trying to sound like a band from the 1960s. They were trying to use all of the best stuff, all the best technology, all the best equipment that they had at their disposal, but they wanted to write songs that were classic sounding that would stand the test of time. You can apply that to any great band that stood the test of time. Uh, but Ryan Bram really was the first guy to nail that in such a succinct way, right? Classic sound, modern fidelity. So that sort of inspired me to write that rush quote on that whiteboard. And that influenced the whole thing. And then, yeah, I was looking at that quote and we were listening to ride into the light to see if there could be any synth anywhere. And I was like, man, let me just follow that, uh, it's like the reverse electric eye riff, right? I basically took electric eye and just reversed it. Uh, and a lot of, maybe not a lot of people, but a few people have thought that's Night Train by Guns N' Roses, but it's electric eye backwards, right? And then threw that mono synth lead on it, literally just one finger following the chord progression. And it was pretty magical. We mixed it down, right? So... Some of y'all who love that song may have not even realized it's there. But if you listen to that, like I said, right before the outro, you'll hear that. Right. And just added a layer of, of coolness. Uh, so that's what I remember about recording it. We sent it off to Howie Weinberg to master it. He's mastered a few things, right? All good. Terry date records which includes Pantera and Overkill, stuff like that. Soundgarden, I think. Uh, all the great Rick Rubin records, Slayer, Danzig, a few things. So we were psyched to work with him. Mike Gitter hooked that up. Shout out Gitter. Uh, so I mentioned the artwork earlier. I've got the original painting by Adam Burke hanging up here over the threshold. Um, obviously, at first, we were just going to have the Warriors writing from the ruins of divided by darkness from all that darkness and pain and chaos and violence and hatred and anger riding off into the light. Uh, and then after our incident with our beloved dogs, we were fortunately able to work them into the cover. I'm pointing over here cause here's where the original is, but it'd probably be up here. Uh, yeah. Adam Burke was cool enough when I hit him up and explained to him what happened 
I was like, I don't give a fuck. Is it metal to have your two puppies running across the front of your album cover? We decided who gives a fuck. And uh, that's what we wanted to do. And that's always the right choice if you're an artist is who gives a fuck. If you find yourself thinking, man, should I really do this? Who gives a fuck, right? Saw risky business at a very early age. And sometimes you got to say, what the fuck? And that got in there. So we put our dogs on the cover and immortalized them in heavy metal history, hopefully. Um, and then Lillian, our friend who did the Cosmic Hummingbird on Divided, she did a piece called uh, Nowhere, right? Nowhere Left to See. Yeah, I cannot remember those lyrics sometimes. It's uh, Nowhere Left to See, Nothing Left to Be. I always get them like mixed around. Waylon Jennings used to do that all the time too. Fuck up his own lyrics. Uh, but Lillian really nailed it with this. You know, it reminds me of some epic Dio type album art. And that's in the gatefold. Uh, this was a joint release between 20 Bucks Spin and Century Media, which I was adamant, adamant about it being a joint release with 20 Bucks Spin. And this sounds corny, but a big part of why I wanted him to be involved in this record and not just jump ship was because he had yet to have as incredible and legendary a label as 20 Bucks Spin is. He'd yet to have a band on the cover of Decibel. So I wanted that to be a possibility. And thanks to Albert at Decibel, it ended up being a possibility and it ended up happening. Um, Dave at 20 bucks, one of my favorite dudes in the whole world still. And I'm a loyal motherfucker, man. And I knew that I knew that in the back of his mind, he wanted a band on the cover of decibel. So, uh, I was determined to make that happen. And I'm super grateful and proud of the fact that me and Dave got to, got to do that together. Uh, so shout out Dave, 20 bucks, man, eternal. What else? Yeah, so we recorded the record, going through hell, made it through, moved to Texas, right? Uh, yeah, started doing the press cycle and everything. We were supposed to do that spring tour with COC in Europe. Uh, Paul Bear put out Forgotten Days in like August of 2020, I think, and we put out Enlightened in October 2020. So Spirit of Drift and Paul Bear had this master plan that we were going to do like a month, two months in the States, a month or two in Europe, and then maybe come back and even do the States again. Uh, we were scheming on y'all, and we all know what happened. None of that happened. Instead, we got stuck at home doing like whatever f streaming, like live but not live bullshit. I hated it. I'm not going to front, dude. We did like a fake album release thing. I fucking hated it. I hated it. Every second of it, dude. <laughs> it's just like, oh my God, it sucked. Um, so we, we didn't get to tour on this album, really. And nobody got to tour on anything for a while, so it's all good. Uh, our set's still pretty heavy on Enlightened, so we're kind of making sure that it, it gets its due in the live setting plus you know i wrote the album to be fun and to be like energetic and good for the live setting so i think these songs a lot of them will be in our set forever you know uh we did let me see here oh i'm gonna back up because this is cool the last show that spirit of drift and gate creeper played with the shared members was decibel metal and beer fest in December of 2019. And that was like the perfect send off. And that's when I really connected with Tom Draper. He was playing in Carcass, right? And he's now in the band, which is fucking awesome. Cause I remember watching Carcass and watching him and watching Bill Steer and thinking, man, I would kill for a guitar player like that, you know? And now I got him. Ha <laughs> ha. Master plan achieved. Uh, so yeah, that's going in reverse there for a minute. So fast forward back to the COVID days. Our album comes out in October. We thought that would be enough time to give it a fair shot. Obviously it wasn't. 
but we played a few shows October of uh, 2021. We went to New York and played a couple shows with High on Fire and Dysrhythmia. That was pretty cool. Uh, heavy experience. I, I talked about it on the Big John episode. Like he should have been there and wasn't there. And so it was much like a lot of the last three years. It's like even the really cool shit can be bittersweet sometimes, you know? Uh, and then I don't know if people remember this, but we were supposed to play New Year's Eve with High on Fire in Berkeley, California. And somebody shut it down. I still don't know who. And the funny thing is, uh, the next week, they opened her back up for a big hardcore fest. So I guess COVID only targets dudes with really good riffs, and it doesn't target uh, two-steppers or something. Who knows? Sorry, if anybody got offended by that, I'm so sorry. Uh, so yeah, we did play a couple shows in support of Enlightened Eternity, but... Uh, the bottom line is, and you've probably heard this from every band, it sucked real bad putting an album out in COVID. It sucked. You know, it did okay. We got good press. Um, yeah, when we moved down to Texas, you know, my friend Raul interviewed me and uh, put me on the cover of the Austin Chronicle without telling me, which was pretty cool. You know, it's a nice welcome. But uh, all that shit is not the same as going out and playing to people. Doing like streaming stuff online, I hate it. I'm never going to do it again. You know, if the world were to shut down again, which I really don't see that ever happening, but if it does, you ain't going to see me playing guitar in a fake live show on YouTube. You know, we were doing what we could at the time. People seemed to dig it. You know, what I said at the time, and I guess it's true, it wasn't for me, it was for whoever it was going to like make them feel better. Uh, so I don't regret doing any of that. I just, man, shit sucks. Not doing it again. So yeah, that's it. Uh, moved to Texas, started jamming in like a crossover thrash band. And, uh, that's how I met Mike Fury, our current drummer. Uh, you know, that high on fire show that was supposed to happen on new year's. Mike learned our set in a week. He learned our whole set in a week, having like not really even heard us before. And we had one practice and I was like, holy shit. I mean, we could, we could play that show. Show got canceled. But, um, if you want to know what Mike Fury is about, that's what he's about. He learned our whole set in a week. Uh, so yeah, I'll, I'll dive into all that on a future episode. You know, we still got Forge Your Future to cover. Uh, and then I'm going to be talking about the new album, hopefully right as it's coming out. So records, I'm going to put off fan mail because I'm already almost an hour into this thing. Uh, and I got some fan mail stacking up. If you have questions or comments or anything like that, email me at bigriffenergy at gmail.com and I will address it. What else? Oh yeah, I should probably mention that we are playing Metal Injection Festival on September 17th uh, with one of my favorite bands ever, Testament, and another childhood favorite, Fear Factory. And they're playing Demanufacture and Obsolete songs, which was like, should have seen me and Mike Fury in the van when we saw that, like a couple of uh, teenagers. Yeah, that should be a good time. Who else was playing Our Day? Machine Head's playing Our Day. Uh, Ex Mortis. Yeah, come on out. The observatory in oh no 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 16th is the observatory. Our day is House of Blues in Anaheim. So come out to Anaheim September 17th. That's gonna be our uh, album release, man, because our album comes out August 18th. So that will be our whatever official album release show. Playing with Testament Fear Factory, not too bad. All right, so now I'm gonna talk about a couple of records that I was listening to religiously when I was working on Enlightened in Eternity. Uh, the Black Sabbath riffs are in there forever. The Matt Pike riffs are in there forever. Slayer, Kirk Winstein riffs are in there forever, right? They're not going anywhere. So I always try to uh, put something else in my brain when I'm looking for inspiration. 
And around the time of writing Enlightened, I was listening to a lot of ACDC Power Age, Power Edge, however you want to say it, and uh, Def Leppard, High and Dry, right? Seeing what I could glean, especially from the Lep, because I was a latecomer to ACDC, but I was a really latecomer to Def Leppard. It took me a long time to do anything other than write that shit off as just like cornball, like not heavy, not cool, not badass, you know? Uh, ACDC, same thing, man. When I was in high school, I was like, this shit sucks. It's all the same. Every song sounds the same. It's boring. P-brained opinion. Absolute P-brained stupidity on my part. I had a friend named Ryan, good friend, uh, who was burning me ACDC mixes all the time and just trying to force me to understand the brilliance of that band and I remember hearing the song Night Prowler, and I was like, all right, that one's badass, and a couple others, Riff Raff. Uh, the first two tracks from Powerage sold me on this band. Down Payment Blues, especially, is one of the most brilliant songs ever written, and there's never been a song that more perfectly described the conundrum and the paradox of being like a a rocker who's perceived as like this cool, successful guy. Uh, you know, he talks about how he has a Cadillac, but he can't afford the gasoline. That's just like one of the most brilliant lyrics ever written. And the whole song's like that. And you just believe him, man. I love Brian Johnson, but uh, Bon Scott is just unparalleled. And if you want to hear a song about the, the highs and lows of this rocker shit. Listen to Down Payment Blues by ACDC and tell me that guy is not feeling real good and real bad all at the same time. Uh, Power Edge is like perfect start to finish. It's one of the few albums I would say that about. Every single song, every single moment of every single song is badass. The whole thing. And it really made me understand the brilliance of how the five components of that band fit together. Do they have a distinct style and you know it's them? Yeah. Isn't that a good thing? Yeah. Is it simple? Yeah. Is it easy? Try playing it. Try playing it. I'll never forget uh, my old band in Phoenix. We had some band next door, the super technical. They were like wizards, like Steve Vai type shit, playing power metal and stuff. Something about a dragon name of the band was like call them out god damn it phoenix and dragon or something like that check them out because they shred but i don't know if they're still around sorry guys i'm not talking shit if you're still around they tried to play highway to hell one night couldn't play it couldn't play it and that's not a knock against them if you don't have phil rudd and malcolm young and cliff that rhythm section you can't play acdc songs they just don't sound right, you know. It's uh, it's all about the attitude and the feel, and you can't teach that, and you can't practice that. So ACDC Power Edge, I was really honed in on that, you know, especially writing some drum and bass parts together that were really thought out as far as the kick and the snare and what the bass guitar was doing in relation to the kick and the snare. Really, I always try to make sure they're locked up, but like really... Uh, specifically and purposefully writing parts for the rhythm section to shine. Uh, the other album that I was really obsessed with at the time, Def Leppard, High and Dry. Like I said, man, I, I was not a fan of Def Leppard ever. Really, probably until 2010, something like that. You know, a lot of my friends in Arkansas who are a little bit older they were around when that stuff was coming out on MTV and when Def Leppard was huge playing arenas and stuff. And I feel like that was a, a real good introductory band for a lot of people who were the right age, getting into rock, hard rock, eventually getting into heavy metal. And Pyromania is great. Hysteria is great for, I, I really love Hysteria to study for, production techniques and you know the mutt laying tricks and the arranging and the just like how to make a huge sounding like hit record but if you want a hard rock 
album with riffs and stuff. High and dry is the one. And yeah, I was just listening to this all the time. You know, it's a, a couple of the songs on it are like a little goofy for my taste, but um, listen to Lady Strange. You know, if you like Thin Lizzy and Priest and Maiden and stuff like that, it's only one slight step away from those kind of bands. And a song like Lady Strange made me uh, open up my heart to the possibility of loving Def Leppard. And I love Def Leppard now. They have really great riffs. They write good songs. Uh, I remember my buddy Jay Bennett giving me like the ultimate compliment on Divided saying like, man, you got some, some choruses that remind me of like Def Leppard choruses. They're just like so huge. Jay, that might actually be uh, the catalyst for me really investigating earlier Def Leppard. So thank you. Uh, yeah. If you want to write a big, massive chorus, you want to write some super incredible vocal melodies and harmonies or some just catchy riffs, cool, fun guitar riffs, you know, that would kind of show back up later with the darkness, which is a band that I fell in love with immediately. Right. Uh, check out high and dry Def Leppard. Also, uh, hypnosis did the album cover. My boy, Joe Patagno was involved with hypnosis. So there he is again. He shut, I was going to mention him earlier, actually. Uh, cause I was having a little bit of a, an issue with some artist related stuff and some complaining. And I thought about, you know, who never complains ever Joe Patagno. And he's been painting for, I don't know, 70 years, something like that. Doubt he's complained once. He's never complained once to me cut from a different cloth. I'll talk more about Joe Patagno in the Ghost at the Gallows episode. Uh, but for now, that's it, man. That's Enlightening Eternity. Boy, I'm glad that's over. I was putting that one off for a while. But I hope you enjoyed it, and uh, I hope you enjoy that album. Put a lot into it. And it, man, I say this cliche shit to people, like, this album helped me. That's why I did it. I needed it. It got me through something, and I hope it helps you. That's real. I'm not just fucking saying that to look all zen and, uh, you know, make myself look good and shit. Quite the opposite, man. Uh, I'm not strong enough to get through some of this shit without music, and that's okay because we have music to help us out, right? So there's Enlightened Eternity. I'm not sure what the next episode of this will be. It might very well be the making of Forge Your Future because I'm trying to clear the path for the making of Ghost at the Gallows by the time it comes out. Going to get Jeff Henson on here for one of those. Uh, we Jeff and I are working on something right now. Keep telling myself. For a second, I was like, damn it, man. This is the first time I finished a record and it's coming out and I don't have the next thing finished. Then I realized, wait, we will have the next thing finished. Well, that's cool. Uh, it's not a not a full blown studio album, but it's gonna be cool, really cool. All right, man, that's it. I love you guys. Thanks to everybody that listens to this and supports what I'm doing. And uh, I'll see you next time. Cheers. Cheers.